not accepting uh, answers like volatile, uncertain, and all that. I want simple black and black or white answers, bullish or bearish. Okay. So if credit spreads are rising, what does this tell us about the debt market's assessment of future economic prospects? Okay, and which you correctly answered, which uh, Goel answered on the second try on the, uh, in the previous class. That this means that the debt market's assessment uh, of the future of future economic prospects is bearish if credit spreads are rising. Okay. Now comes the second part of the question. Justify your answer. And I've already justified it in the previous, just doing a recap here, okay? I've already given you the stepwise logic as to how you will justify your answer. Is my question clear to everyone? Okay? So, can you justify? And I asked you guys when you and Gaba came up after the class, I told you guys to go and check the video. Sorry? No, explain to me stepwise. I don't understand anything. I'm a computer. Everything has to be told to me. Even sun rises in the east, you have to feed that information. Otherwise, I don't know that the sun rises in the east. Everything has to be explained. Explain stepwise. What you see is the phenomenon that credit spreads are rising. Okay? You see this phenomenon that credit spreads are rising. Where is our chart? All right. Here you have the credit spreads. Okay? This is your just above, just manages to be, BAA is just managing to be investment grade. Kind of the lowest rung of investment grade. Okay? Below this will be junk. So this, when we look at the one year data on the credit spread, we see that it's rising, okay? So now you go stepwise from here, you see this phenomenon that credit spreads have been rising from, uh, for the last one year, and then you come to the conclusion that this must necessarily mean that ceteris paribus, okay? Which means everything else has to remain the same. Ceteris paribus, this must necessarily mean that the debt market's assessment of future economic prospects is bearish, okay? Which means they're expecting an economic downturn. Is this clear? Okay. Doesn't have to be a recession, just a downturn. All right. So, can you go stepwise from your first observation that credit spreads are rising to the conclusion? No. Is my question clear? Yes. Okay. Who will do that? Is my question clear to everyone? Yes. Sir. What? Question is not clear. You don't know the answer. Question is not clear. You see that credit spreads are okay. Both. All right. Okay. So yes, Shivam. Question is not clear. You see that credit spreads are rising. You know what credit spreads are? Do you know what credit spreads are? <laughs> but do you know what a credit spread is as a component of a company's of a corporate of a corporate's uh, cost of debt as a component of a corporate's cost of debt? You know what the credit spread is? What are the two components of a corporate's cost of debt? <coughs> what bonds? <coughs> Credit spread and the government bond benchmark. Okay. So now you have two components. Okay. So you see that one of the components is going up and we said Cetris Paribus means we can assume that the other component which is the government bond yield is not moving. You see this moving, you see it going up and then you come to the conclusion which Bola has told you that uh, the conclusion is that this means that the debt market believes that future economic prospects are bearish they are expecting an economic downturn okay so now you explain to me why i'm not able to follow your logic explain to me why this observation leads to this conclusion stepwise every every logical step has to be uh, clearly stated anybody chatta you want to help us no can you come and give your phone put your phone here you're also too busy with your phone come and put place your phone here Phone is in the pocket, so what are you looking at? Yeah. Okay. So, are you able to explain this stepwise? Rhea? So, what is the No, not what is the spread. The question I last asked to Shivam. Is my question clear? Anybody here who doesn't understand the question? Is anyone here who doesn't understand the question? Yes? No? Okay, who will do the sign? Okay, then let's give it to Goyal. Let's get the uh, give it to Goyal. Okay, so let's try and write this down also. Since you this is all basic stuff, which you and remember this has already been explained in the last class. Okay? This has already been explained in the last class. Where is the material on credit spreads? So I'm just gonna make sure I write this. Um, yeah, we already have the decomposition of the uh, of these uh, the components of the cost of debt. 
So I'm going to write this here before the junk bond market segment. All right. All right. So in shorthand, but uh, just to make sure that you understand, at least the stepwise logic should be clear. And the way you answer this question will also teach you how to answer almost any other any question. Every question should be answered like this. Stepwise logic and everything has to be stated. Okay. All right. So um, now first is um, um, evidence. Let's write it this way. We're going to write very crude English. We just want to make sure that we the point is communicated to the people in the class. Evidence is uh, credit spreads are rising. Okay. Conclusion equal to debt markets um, view on future econ prospect is bearish. Is this clear to everybody if we write it like this? Yes. Is everyone following? So we see the evidence that the credit spreads are rising that we can see from pulling up a chart. Okay. If you're working in an institution, you'll probably have a Bloomberg or a Reuters machine where you can pull up the credit spread, just like I pulled it up from the St. Louis Fed page. Okay, so I see this evidence and I immediately conclude that the debt market's view of uh, future economic prospects is bearish. Okay, so now how? What is the stepwise logic? Okay, yes, Goel will now tell us. Um, sir, uh, the, uh, the uh, debt capital debt holders, uh, the uh, because of the uncertainty and the uh, increase in the risk, so sir, the uh, uh, so the expectation of the debt holder would increase due to which uh, due to which the yield of the due to which the yield will also increase. Uh, for say, uh, if a uh, your mic is not being used properly, hello, you need to hello. be yeah you need to be able to sense that your voice is coming through the mic. This is all part of the training, okay? Why we are using the mic in the class, yeah. Because when you speak in public, one of the things that people will expect from, expect from MBAs is good communication skills, ability to use office productivity software, okay, which is your Excel. Don't like uh, branded people don't say Excel Word, Excel. You say office productivity software, such as Excel Word, etc. Okay, the general term is office productivity software. Okay, okay, yeah, and, in in and including being able to speak in public confidently. Yes, okay, sir. and making sure that your voice is coming through. Yeah, yeah. Okay, go ahead now. Go ahead. So, sir, for uh, instance, an investor is invested in a security which is uh, holding a less risk. So, sir, uh, if the there is uncertainty in the economy or in the global uh, global economies. So, sir, uh, the trade and everything will slow down and the rate of the capital would be... Again, you are going back to your first answer, uncertainty. We are talking about, you gave the answer uh, uh, as, the second answer you gave was the economic slowdown, which is bearish view of prospects. So, we are talking about very black or white views on, mark, uh, on economic prospects, not about anything like uncertainty, volatility and all these things. So, you are saying and then you are bringing the conclusion into your logic. You are already bringing the conclusion into your logic. Are you following? Yes, okay, you give your answer, then I'll tell you how to answer it properly. Okay. So, sir, uh, because of the uh, slowdown, so the, uh, the risk appetite of the, uh, the risk would be, uh, the risk Listen to what he's saying. Would, yeah. uh, having would increase. Uh, so, therefore, sir, the, uh, the yield would, uh, the expectation, their expectation would also be increasing. So, that's why uh, we, we can conclude that the, Credit would also increase. Okay. Okay. Fine. So it's a it's a it's an okay answer, but you're partly some of the errors you have made is you have actually assumed the conclusion. You are trying to prove why this evidence leads to the conclusion. So you have factored in the economic downturn expectations of the economic downturn into your answer. Okay. That's not how it should be answered. So when you see the credit spread is rising, and we have already said Cetris paribus, which means that. This is how you should answer it. So you say credit spread is rising. Okay. Then uh, set par, then this means. So that means the address paribus means that the other component of the of the total cost of debt is not moving. Yes, right? The treasury bond yield is not moving. Okay. Only the credit spread is rising. So this implies that total. So, but this is cost logical, of, hmm? but this is illogical that other factors are not moving or no no like we are not trying to uh, practice how to work in a in a real world situation for that you have your 
uh, trading projects etc where everything's moving all over the place okay but here we're trying to understand the theory okay so just like you do in economics to understand the theory and to do sensitivity analysis okay or uh, this is not exactly sensitivity analysis but to understand the theory very often to understand exactly how the logic uh, the impact of one factor is uh, manifested you have to hold the you have to assume that the other factors are held constant otherwise you can't uh, you know come to any conclusions okay in real life of course everything is moving all over the place okay all right so uh, if the credit spread is rising and i said centrist parameters that means other component of the other component of the total cost of debt which is the benchmark government bond yield is not moving right so here we can tot it straight away conclude that implies that total cost of debt is higher okay or has risen okay let's call say is it has risen are you following if you don't follow any step of the logic then you can interrupt and ask a question is this clear okay so the total cost of debt is risen okay which means at every step we say implies okay which means that uh, debt investors are now demanding <coughs> demanding a higher return my space bar will also become sticky actually all right investing in corporate bonds is this logic clear you're following if the, the total cost of debt has risen that means we can see clearly that debt market investors are are requiring a higher rate of return right yeah then we are following okay higher rate of return for y ytm for investing in corporate bonds okay all right implies that debt investors are now fearing uh, okay and now let's say um, now seeing higher risk um, in so this is your standard finance logic that when you see a situation of higher risk you will invest you will require a higher return that means in lending to the us government you take a certain 10 percent return let's say but if you all have to invest in general electric you will require higher than 10 percent return because that stock is their the bonds are riskier than that of the us government right so this is basic finance so if you see that the investors are expecting a higher return that means it has to be true that they are expecting higher risk is this clear okay this is also related once again to the set part uh, component okay because essentially it is the credit spread uh, because it is the credit spread that is rising okay and what is the what is the credit spread supposed to represent the credit spread is supposed to represent the uh, specific risk okay of the this is kind of similar very loosely similar to the concept of your beta right the credit spread is supposed to because credit spreads are given to you for particular grades of corporate remember we showed you that grading table the grading table the rating table okay for so when you have a double a credit that's just like you look at this chart you have two credit spreads this is high grade this is uh, low grade corporate bonds okay which means let's assume that these are the b double a okay and these are maybe let's say the high grade let's call it triple uh, a okay so credit spreads are uh, unique to each category of rating okay for every category of rating there is a different credit spread okay so therefore what the credit spread actually prices okay is essentially the particular the unique credit risk of that particular grade of corporate debt is this clear okay since that is rising that means clearly that the invest that investors are seeing a higher risk uh, uh, of loss in investing in these uh, this category of corporate debt is this clear so yeah uh, so for example uh, what is what should be there uh, for example uh, if oil is oil prices are increasing then it is uh, harmful for uh, for say uh, the country which are consuming more oil yeah. and if and it is increasing then it is beneficial for them 
and for, what should be the it should be its price or a slope so that there is a global growth all over the trend Okay, this is a slightly unrelated question. I'll come to that later. Let me finish this logic because we are in a particular sub module. Let me finish this. Let's go through this logic. We'll come to this. A slightly tangential question. I'll come, I'm not saying it's irrelevant. We'll come to this. One sec. Okay. All right. Let me finish this logic. Okay. So, is this clear that dead investors are expecting a higher return, which means they are expecting a higher risk of, uh, they see higher risk from, are now seeing higher risk in investing in, uh, in corporate bonds. Okay. Of that. Uh, credit uh, rating uh, class, okay, which is triple A, B double A, or whatever it is, okay, because it is the credit spread that is rising. Is that is this clear? Why am I writing this? Because the credit spread measures specifically that the risk of default of that particular uh, the the credit risk associated with investing in that category of debt. Is this clear? Okay. Now this, okay, okay. Let me just make this, which means they are seeing a risk of default. Okay, here if you are holding, if you are buying a particular bond and holding to maturity, there is no market risk as such. If you are a debt investor who buys a bond and holds it to maturity, there is no market risk at the end of the day because you are holding the bond till maturity. So the only real risk is the credit risk. Right, the fact that the bond may not pay, they may not pay their, uh, you know, uh, their obligations. Okay, okay. So um, high risk in investing, uh, that is higher risk of default. Okay, is this clear? Okay. This logic follows because. The, if you hold a, hold a bond to maturity, there is no market risk. You can hold it till the end. If there is no default, you will get the full full amount. You will get all the coupons. You will get the principal, everything, right? Mm -hmm. So there is only a mark to market risk in between. But towards the, at the end of the maturity, hold to maturity, there is no mark, mark to market risk. Which is why if you look at the accounting standards, when they deal with particular types of bonds, which are when, which the, uh, the particular balance sheet that is being uh, you know uh, for which the accounting is being done if that entity says that we are going to these are hold to maturity bonds those are not subject to mark to market requirements because you're holding those to maturity so the mark to market swings don't matter okay so only the credit risk matters everybody following the logic till now yes sir. okay so there's a higher risk of credit uh, there's a higher credit risk perception of higher credit risk is this clear on the part of the dead investors okay now higher credit risk in corporate bonds is associated with strong economies or, uh, or weak economies right higher credit risk in corporate bonds will, will basically is associated with a with a weak economy a weak or weakening economy all right okay uh, so because of the slowdown Okay, is this clear? Yes, so when you see a prospect of when, uh, when do you expect higher uh, higher risk, higher credit, higher defaults in corporate debt? That's when uh, when the economy goes into a downturn. Okay, that's when everybody's cash flows start to get negatively affected. Okay, because nobody is making money, and so therefore that's where you see higher risk of default in corporate bonds. Is this clear? Logic is clear. Okay, so therefore with a weakening economy, so now you can say that thus. The debt market's view Where is this? A view of uh, our future uh, must be bearish. Is this clear now? Has everyone understood? Because they are behaving in a way that they are demanding a higher return, which means they are expecting higher risk. Higher risk in a corporate bond which is held to maturity will only be credit risk, not really market risk because you are holding it to maturity. So if they are expecting higher credit risk in corporate bonds, that means that that kind of a scenario is associated with a weakening economy. That means therefore that they are expecting a weakening economy. 
This is clear to everyone, yeah. the stepwise logic. Okay, so this is how you should answer questions. So this way also makes also make sure that all the intermediate intermediate logical steps are clear to you. Okay, and you also are clear about what needs to be stated. Okay, in logic, there's something called a suppressed premise. Okay, have you heard this? Did I did I give you guys a logic textbook? Yes, Introduction to logic. Yes, Nobody's read it. No, Most important subject in the world. More important than maths. Okay, logic is the mother of all subjects. So if you want to do well in life, I would strongly recommend read through that book. That's a very good book actually as an introduction to logic. Basic uh, arguments when you're having basic arguments with people. Okay, you'll be able to see flaws in their arguments. Very important. It's actually, it's a tragedy of higher education that unless you're studying philosophy or mathematics, you have no exposure to logic. I have also never done a formal course in logic, but I know that this is a deficiency. I need to fix it. Okay, so this is a problem with our education system that we don't teach logic anywhere. Even in law, even in law, they don't teach logic. Three years LLB program, <laughs> pure LLB. No, five year is a mixed program. That is BA LLB. So I did a three year LLB program. It's a pure law focused program. There is not a single course on logic. Okay, so it's totally bizarre. You know, there should be at least two courses on logic. Anyway, so what what you have to understand is that basic thing called a syllogism, okay, which is that understand this basic concept, okay. Um, no, one minute. Let's put it this way, okay. All men are mortal, okay. Be therefore, but it's a, such a big word, I'm just using thus. Thus, Socrates is what is the conclusion? Mortal. Okay, good. All right, so now here, okay, so this is what is called a basic syllogism. Okay, this is a basic structure of argument in logic. All men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore, Socrates is mortal. Okay, now here, these two are the premises. Okay. Let's call this premise. Sorry, one minute, one minute. And this is called the conclusion. Okay, yes. So the other day you were telling about the person in your wallpaper that is called the that is what that is not socrates you already forgotten who these two people are aristotle, aristotle and plato. plato right so the guy on the older man is plato because he's the teacher and aristotle is the younger the student okay so um, this is so so these are plato was actually the student of socrates okay, so socrates is the first in line that is why I Ha, that's good. At least good that you're making the connection. Okay, but that there was no mention of Socrates in that except that the uh, Yeah, I, I did tell you the story of Socrates that he was the first in line. Okay, so understand this basic structure at least of arguments Okay, as I told you for your own good make sure you read the book on logic because it's the mother of all subjects It, it, it is required in any subject in the world. Okay, so now if if what we do is if I were to leave out this thing if I were to leave out this thing the part that I've highlighted, okay? If I just stated the argument like this, understand this concept of a suppressed premise, okay? The point I'm trying to make here is that if I only said to you, all men are mortal, therefore Socrates is mortal. Here, th if this is all that came out of my mouth, then the person who's listening to me would say that, hold on a second, you are using a suppressed premise. Because your conclusion cannot follow from that first premise that you stated. You only stated all men are mortal. And then the next step you jump to the conclusion saying that Socrates is mortal. You have forgotten to mention the other premise that is required for to, to arrive at this conclusion. Which is that Socrates is a man. Are you following what I am saying? So if you leave it out, that is called a suppressed premise. Okay, I am just going to write out what is a suppressed premise. Okay, let me just copy this and do it again. Okay. You should at least understand this because you'll find in many disciplines and many arguments everywhere, you'll find that people are use people are suppressing premises. Sometimes they're not even aware of what premise they have what is the suppressed premise in their argument. Okay, because you'll see that people are coming to conclusions all the time. If I leave out this, 
okay then here not this part okay, I need to have that premise part Are you following yes. what I stated here? Yes. If you only say all men are mortal and uh, thus Socrates is mortal, let's move it to the other side so that it is distinguished from the. Um, okay. All right. This is clear. Okay. Let's. Um, no, no, it's not the conclusion. It is merely a suppressed premise. What you will have to say if somebody says to you that so all men are mortal, therefore Socrates is mortal. Okay? All you have, all you have to say to that person is that in your argument there is a suppressed premise. Okay, this is like a basic structure of an argument, also you can say. Okay, this is in your argument there is a suppressed premise, is that you need to also make the assumption that Socrates is a man. That Socrates belongs to this class called mankind. And, and all members of that class are mortal, so therefore he must have the property of all members of that class, he must also be mortal. But you left out that suppressed premise, okay, because you left it out, that's why it's called a suppressed premise. Is this clear? So when you're watching arguments or you're participating in arguments, you'll notice people are making these kind of statements all the time in every discipline, but very often they will have suppressed premises. So the reason I went, went through this kind of... Uh, a logical stepwise reply to the uh, to explanation of this uh, of this point okay why does it mean why does it uh, why do why do rising credit spreads imply that the debt market is uh, fearing an economic downturn okay the reason i went through logically is that here you will notice that there is no suppressed premise all the premises have been stated okay all the premises that are required for the conclusion okay so this is how you should answer questions so every statement that you make whenever you're talking on a particular topic you're trying to reach a conclusion you have to make sure that there are no suppressed premises in your conclusion and then there, there are also the point that uh, your conclusion is actually supported by your premise uh, by your premises okay are you following sometimes people come up with conclusions that don't necessarily follow okay so it is like saying that i say that lakshya lives in rohini uh, Sahil is pursuing B.Tech, therefore Saksham should not be allowed to enter the campus. <laughs> I mean, there is no logic. The conclusion does not follow from the two premises that I have given. Okay, so this is an extreme example that I have given you, but very often you will find that th there are people making arguments which are a little bit subtler to detect. I mean, here the obviously the error is quite obvious, okay, what I have said, in what I have said. But very often you will find that people are making arguments where the conclusion does not follow from the premises. <coughs> the conclusion has to mechanically follow from the premises. Here, if you accept, okay, are you following this point? Yes. yes sir. That if you accept the truth of all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, then there is no getting away from the fact that Socrates must be mortal. Is this clear? Yes. So this is the point of a good argument is that it does not have to be true. But if, if you assume that the premises are true, then the conclusion should follow mechanically from the premises. I mean, you cannot get away from the conclusion if you accept the truth of the premises. Are you following? Yes. This is what is meant by a good argument, where this is the only valid argument. Okay, this argument is valid because if you accept the truth of the premises, the conclusion will follow inevitably. There is no way you can prevent the conclusion. So you have to look out for when people are making arguments, are they making arguments where the conclusion is not supported by the premises. Okay. All right. And um, I don't know, we should discuss Hume's law, but uh, I think we'll, we'll leave that out because there's another important point where people actually make, um, you understand the difference, but we've already covered these points before, some of these points, normative and positive. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. That essentially. So let me also tell you something because it's also very important actually, because you'll find people making these mistakes all the time. All right which is there's something in logic called Hume's law, okay? Hume's law essentially says that A, now that you guys are already experts in normative and positive, I can easily state this law, okay? A, and you also know what is a premise and a conclusion, okay? 
So I'm glad we had this discussion because it's very important to have the at least basic grounding in logic. Some this is like very, very, very just like half a session. Okay. A normative conclusion can't, I'm just writing short form, can't follow from a set of purely positive premises here normative and positive is the way you learnt it okay so what is normative is it subjective or objective subjective normative is subjective so it's, it's closer to subjective than it is to objective and positive is objective. more closer to so, so if i say the distance from dsb to pitampura metro is three kilometers is that a positive statement or a normative statement it's a positive statement it may be wrong the distance may actually be one kilometer okay it doesn't have to be right but it should be a type of statement which you can verify easily uh, with objective verification anybody will come to the same conclusion once they measure it they'll see that the distance is only one kilometer okay here what is the suppressed premise in this argument that the distance is only the distance is uh, let's say we are having this argument okay that uh, whether the distance or and i are arguing he's saying it is three kilometers i'm saying it is two kilometers okay and you say that this argument is a po it's a positive debate okay you would say this is a positive debate so what is the suppressed premise in uh, saying that this is a positive debate you're making an assumption somewhere uh, in in saying that this is a positive debate discussing yeah so that we agree on what is a well, you didn't give the right answer but i just the, <laughs> this question was asked to you in lab if you remember yes. this question was asked to you in lab the assumption is that we agree on what is a kilometer yes. Yes. now if he starts saying that a kilometer is maybe six miles then we have a problem because we don't even agree on what a kilometer is then we have another debate okay so it is basically you have to assume that they agree if they agree that as a kilometer this is a purely positive debate okay all right okay so um, now uh, so hume's law essentially said this is important to understand because again you will find in the world of business people are routinely making this mistake they will make a, 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 a normative conclusion is if i say something like cigarette smoking is bad is that a normal conclusion? Yes. yes sir. Okay, because I'm saying it's bad. Some people might say it's it's a good thing. Okay, so you can't really say or if I say consumption of alcohol is bad or immoral. Okay, is that a normative or positive statement? Normative. Normative statement. Okay. So if I say that, so if so, so the point of Hume's law is that you understand what are premises and conclusions. Yes, sir. You also understand what is normative and positive. So all that Hume's law is saying is that. Because you'll notice that in life, what people do is when you're uh, when you're dealing with people in, in the business world, it is uh, replete with instances where people will try to come up with a normative conclusion. Okay, they'll come up with a normative conclusion and they'll try to get you to agree to that normative conclusion. They want you to believe that this statement is desirable. Okay, that suppose some kind of policy that we should have income, we should redistribute wealth so that everybody has the same amount of wealth. Okay. This is a policy prescription. Okay, is this a normative or a positive statement? We should redistribute wealth so that everybody has the same net worth. It's a normative, it's a normative statement. We should do this. Okay, and usually they will support it with some kind of positive statements. But actually, what Hume's law tells you is positive statement like there are so many poor people in this country and child malnutrition levels are you know are worse than some. So let's take this argument. Okay. Let, let's say that India has, uh, you know, uh, India's average per capita uh, back per capita income is extremely low. Let's say to uh, one or five hundred dollars. Okay, let's just say. Okay, then we have India has child malnutrition levels worse than sub sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, and then maybe uh, forty percent of Indians have not completed a school education. Okay, uh, these are all statements. Do you notice that the premises are all positive? Yes. First thing I said was per capita income in GDP in India is let's say five hundred dollars. Okay, then I said that sub uh, child malnutrition levels in India are worse than sub-Saharan Africa. Positive statement. Okay. Third, I said that let's say forty percent of Indians have not graduated from high school. Okay. Positive statement. All are positive statements. Okay. Then I come out with my policy conclusion. Therefore, uh, therefore wealth should be redistributed so that everybody has the same net worth. What is this? Is a normative conclusion? Is this a normative conclusion? Okay. So the point is that the point I'm not giving you a very good example, but the point I'm trying to illustrate is that uh, if you are going to come up with a normative conclusion, 
somewhere in your premises you can have hundreds of premises leading to your conclusion okay that somewhere in your premises there must be a normative premise are you following this? this is important to understand because you will encounter this in the business world all the time so this is the importance of studying logic that you will uh, make sure you understand this everybody Nikhil have you followed what I'm saying so in order to come up with this in order for my argument to be valid okay so Hume's law is talking about basically valid arguments if Hume's law essentially another way of stating is that stating it is that if you have a set of purely positive premises like I said that um, you know um, child malnutrition levels are very high uh, graduation rates are very low okay then um, what is the other one I said per capita GDP is very low okay three are three premises I stated okay all of these are positive state uh, as premises these are statements of fact okay now my research may not be correct it may the figures may be wrong but the, you can verify that okay these are all positive statements from these positive statements I came out with a conclusion saying that therefore wealth should be redistributed so that everybody has the same net worth this is a policy almost every policy prescription that you see these are all normative statements check for that every policy prescription is essentially most of them 99% will be normative statements okay so what Hume's law is saying essentially is that this is not a valid argument if you are coming up with a normative conclusion based on a set of purely positive premises this is not a valid argument are you following yes. valid argument is remember how we defined a valid argument the conclusion must follow mechanically from the premises it will be logically correct yeah well let's the term that is used is we should write this down also Valid argument means a conclusion follows inevitably from premises. Okay. This is also an important concept. What is a valid argument in logic? Okay. It is only that kind of argument where if and remember that premises need not be true please remember that okay a valid argument does not require that the premises be true it only requires that if you assume that the premises are true that's all if you assume that the premises are true then the conclusion must follow inevitably there is no other way around it okay there's no two ways about it if the premises are true the premises need not be true essentially it, all it says is that truth of <laughs> this is very important stuff which you should be aware of this is very basic grounding and logic which will come uh, come in handy for you in every uh, area of life because you will encounter people who are making all kinds of invalid arguments you should be able to point out that the argument is invalid because no one can argue against logic no one can argue against the principles of logic no one can tell you that the principles of logic you're citing are not valid okay no one can tell you that okay all right so truth of premises is this clear valid argument this is what a valid argument is the valid argument means that is, is the statement clear to everyone is this good enough to explain it to everyone a valid argument is one where the truth of the premises if you assume that it will guarantee the truth of the conclusion the premises need not be true okay it could be any kind of fictitious statement but if you assume that the premises are true the conclusion will always be true that is a valid argument as you said that premises should also need to be mechanical correct so in order the in order to conclusion to be true the premises has to be true and and follow up for a particular mechanical procedure no 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 that's not exactly what i said be careful <laughs> about what i said what i said is that if you assume that the premises are true then the conclusion is always true in a valid argument that is how you distinguish a valid argument from an invalid argument is this clear is everyone following yes. okay so that's what Hume's law is another way this I should actually go this should go up I should not uh, put it here so you have learned some important concepts here if Boyle is not convinced we'll have to convince him later okay so um, 
All right. Suppressed premise is one thing you learn. Valid argument, okay? And Hume's law is essentially another way of testing for a valid argument. Is a is a particular type of invalid argument that you see that can be uh, you know identified using Hume's law. Is everyone following so far? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, who's sitting at the back? Akshit, are you following? Yes. You just woke up. <laughs> okay. All right. So. Uh, so it, the valid argument concept is clear to everyone now. Gaba is it clear? It's it's an argument where if you if you accept the truth of the premises, the conclusion is always true. Okay, this is clear. But the premises need not be true. They need not actually be factually correct. It could be anything. But if you assume that those statements are true, then the conclusion always follows from those statements. That's a valid argument. And what Hume's law is saying, since you guys already know normative and positive, think about it. It's very logical that Hume's law is saying essentially that if your premises are purely positive statements, okay, like India's per capita GDP is very low, India's uh, uh, GDP, uh, India's uh, mal child malnutrition levels are very high then India's school graduation rates are very low and then these are your three premises then you come up with a conclusion saying therefore wealth should be redistributed so that everybody has the same net worth. This conclusion does not follow from these three premises. You would have to add is that point clear to everyone that it doesn't follow from these three premises? Everyone should be at equal. Yeah so you have to add here there is a in this argument you could say that there is a suppressed premise you have to add one more premise saying that the objective of policy should be to redistribute wealth in such a way that child malnutrition levels are lowered, its high school graduation rates are increased and per capita GDP is raised. Are you following? Yes. If you add one more step in the logic where you say that the objective of economic policy should be to target these outcomes, high per, per capita GDP, high high school graduation rates, low child malnutrition levels by redistributing uh, wealth so that everybody has the same net worth. Then you can conclude this. That should actually be your first premise. Your first premise, then you say this is what policy should be doing. Then you list out that look, this is so bad, this is so bad, this is so bad. Therefore, we should redistribute wealth to achieve this policy outcome. Is this clear? Okay. Everyone follows? Chanda, are you following? Okay. Is everyone clear? Sandhya? Okay. So, this is what this is also a very important concept to understand Hume's law. Because again, you'll notice in life, this is happening repeatedly. Okay, you'll see all these policy experts coming and giving policy that what is the reason for your policy? Uh, they'll list some facts. Okay, facts are always positive. So they are assumptions. Fact, whatever it is, but those are positive. Facts are always positive. Okay, like uh, whatever our basic income, average urban urban dweller spends 35% or 45% of his income on food. Okay, these are all statistics. These are all positive statements. They may be wrong, but these are all positive statements. So they'll come up with a bunch of positive conclusions and then they'll come up with a policy. Remember, 99.9% .9 of all policy prescriptions are normative. Yeah. Every policy prescription is normative. Okay, so therefore this violates Hume's law and this is you will see every happening every day in the world of economics and policy making. So you should be aware of these points. Okay, so yes, so Goel is not happy but we have had a little discussion on logic. So I hope everybody else is not unhappy. Okay, all right. Okay, so basic understanding of logic is required. So this is our detour on logic. So we should, we should give it a separate color. Who said it's not a part of the exam? It can easily be been taught in the class. Anything taught in the class is part of your syllabus. Where is the coloring business? What should be the color for logic? Red. Red, we do not be able to see anything. Okay, let it be like this. Now we already give it, okay? <laughs> you can't read it, but I'm sure you can. I'll, I'll change the color to something more, uh, something lighter. Okay. So this will be a lighter moment. Green. Okay. Should we have this green? Yes. Okay. I'll change it later. Let's not waste class time. Okay. All right. So. Um, so you understood the point that we wanted to recap initially from uh, we are still in the previous day's uh, session 
but we've added this little module on logic okay so you understood this point this is also very important because i think most people were not clear about the logic okay why does why do rising credit spreads imply a debt the, the debt market uh, imply that the debt market fears an economic downturn yes okay yes. this logic is clear to everybody now okay right so let's continue quickly with this and uh, we'll we'll just finish that uh, we are actually running very far behind but i don't think we've wasted any time in class other than that policy discussion that we had no that was interesting okay <laughs> you actually learned something from it yes, 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 okay, good. in that case we, we haven't wasted any time okay now before we go on to the saudi global bond pricing case let's address goel's question because he's very unhappy the logic discussion has left goel very unhappy so we have to appease him now yes i understood your question about the oil price so what goel was saying is Let's look at the oil price. When we are having the discussion, let's look at the oil price. Uh, let's call this U.S. oil. U.S. oil is for which um, WTI is what? West Texas. West Texas. West Texas. Intermediate. Intermediate. Okay. So, and what is the other important grade of crude oil? Brent. Okay. UK. Yeah, it is basically uh, North Sea Brent. Okay, uh, Brent blend uh, is, is what is trade. Okay, so uh, I don't know why this is not loading. So West Texas Intermediate oil price, most speculative, uh, one of the very, uh, very, very highly speculative contracts. All right, um, and therefore that's why one of the reasons why it's very liquid. Okay, very very liquid contract. Okay, so uh, what he's saying, what Goyal is saying is that as the oil price goes up, what is the normal impact on the economy? Ceteris paribus. Sure. Rising oil prices, especially those economies which are consumers of oil, yeah. it is negative. Okay, it has a negative income. Goes up. I, I said those who are as the oil price goes up, those who are consumers of oil, such as India, Japan, etc., that will affect their economies negatively. Okay, and those who are producers of oil, it is affecting them positively. Okay. All right. Now the reverse is true. Obviously, when oil prices fall. It is better for oil consumers and bad for oil producers. Okay, which is what you see in this Saudi global bond pricing case. This is from 2016. Okay, if you see 2016, what was happening to the oil price? What was the state of the oil price? It was high or low? High. High. 2016. It was pretty low because remember 2016 they're uh, facing the results of this. Uh, we should actually take the full monthly chart because uh, he, this one has a lot of data so we should be able to see the yeah. we can actually just have weekly all right okay so what he's saying is what is the optimal level for the oil price that's what you're asking good for both everybody okay so there's no uh, you're asking that what is the right oil price for for uh, which is good for everybody one minute one minute one, one at a time let him give him the mic where is the mic yeah use the mic your question is what is the optimal oil price global growth what should be the optimal point of the any commodity or oil or let's take oil as an example okay so now this is actually so for, i mean this question is slightly academic because uh, he's asking what is the optimal level of the oil price to foster economic broad based economic growth across the, around the world okay so that both producers and consumers are uh, able to uh, prosper okay so the first question first, first point to note about this is that uh, this is a slightly academic question because even if you knew what the optimal price was there would be no way for you to enforce it because the oil price, the oil market is so deep and liquid that nobody can influence the oil price. Okay, not even OPEC, which is the biggest US, oil cartel. US can. Well, you could say that, uh, but you can't really conclusively prove this. The US, you could say that this recent fall in the oil price, the last pro fall in the oil price is because the market was expecting, and uh, when the when the oil price was getting bid up, the market was fearing that the imposition of sanctions on the Iran uh, on Iranian oil would take about two and more than two million dollars uh, two million barrels per day off the market okay and therefore uh, it could create a supply shortage so people were bidding up the oil price uh, in anticipation of that okay but in fact eventually what happened is that the us gave a lot of sanctions to china india etc so the perceived shortage in the oil price on the back of which the market was bidding up the oil price that was what turned out to be an excessive uh, fear okay because the supply shortage was much less so then the price collapsed okay and again it's rising now okay so the point is that you can't 
that is the general wisdom in the market that that's why it happened okay and it seems to make sense but understand that this is also another important thing to understand about financial markets is that you actually never really know why um, the market is moving in, in, a, in a strictly scientific sense in the sense that if you take if you go into a chemistry lab put water in a beaker nothing else is happening you just apply heat to the beaker and the water starts boiling then you know conclusively that it is the application of heat to the beaker that made the water boil and nothing else is re responsible for it okay but here in the financial markets although people like to believe that they know why the market moved in the way it did to don't fool yourself because strictly speaking in that scientific sense you never really know why the market did what it did. All it works on the human expectations. Yeah, it is all driven by expectations. Expectations are not rational. So many factors are in play. So it is it is difficult to be uh, sure in that sense, in the scientific sense. Is everyone clear about this? Yes. This is also very important to understand as students of finance because your normal textbooks and your models and all will not tell you this. You need to be aware. You don't fool yourself that in a scientific sense you never really know why the market is moving in the way it is this is just people like to say that it happened because of this because people like to believe that they know the reason you understand at the end of the day you are dealing with human beings human beings like to believe human beings like to believe that they know why things are happening all right it's very difficult for people to accept that we don't know why this is happening is this clear okay so the the point is that we don't really know and then there is no way to influence the oil so even if you knew what the optimal oil price is many people in the market are saying it is somewhere between 45 and 55 dollars right now okay but that assessment will change maybe five to three uh, years in the future okay because all things are always moving because supply is changing dramatically u.s shale oil okay the revolution in u.s say shale that's why the u.s is now the world's biggest producer okay it's the biggest producer of oil and uh, oil and natural gas why because of the shale oil revolution okay they dig into the goy oil and this is you see how innovation drives change okay although this is possible in the u.s economy it's not happened anywhere else because that is the most competitive and free market economy in the world that's why you have all this innovation okay so so basically the short answer let me answer your question okay you're like a journalist you are asking one question before I finish answering your question, you are asking another question. Okay, so like you see these journalists when they are trying to interrogate Trump. Okay, before he finishes answering the first question, they are asking the second question. Okay, so uh, uh, now the point is that they are the, even if you knew there was nothing you could do about it, people now say it is around 45 to 55 dollars, but things could change. Okay, so it's an academic question. You only have to look at what is your cost of production. Like Saudi cost of production is very low. It's around twenty dollars a barrel, whereas U.S. shale cost of production is near forty dollars a barrel. So those guys are more vulnerable. Okay. So these are some factors you have to look at. So you you can only control your own cost of production. Okay, and how you manage with that. Yes. What is? You have another question. So the market is saying that the oil prices would be around zero, around zero, uh, around zero, because the energy will shift to renewable energies and other e-mobilities. So the price of the oil would be reduced to zero. No, no. Where did you hear this? Al Gore. Sorry. Al Gore told you this. You know who Al Gore is? No, no. no so he is saying that. Okay. So he's saying that renewable energy and all you need a lot of discussion about sustainability and renewable energy and all that. But let's get this one thing clear. Okay. The percentage of global energy needs that are being supplied by fossil fuels has not really changed in the last 30 or 40 years. It is still the same percentage. So even if we are going to migrate to a renewable energy universe, it will take many, many years. It's not 2050 is too close. That's what we and 2050 is, you know, one minute, another thing. One other thing I have to caution you against, don't get swayed by these statements, global sweeping statements about what will happen in 2050. People can't even predict what will happen 15 seconds from now and they are predicting 2050. Okay, so this is, uh, this is another thing that you should be careful about. You see that there's a lot of talk in the US markets right now, for instance, about or it was until a couple of, year, a couple of uh, months ago that people are getting restless because i can see i think the time is approaching yes so but we have to have these discussions we have enough time don't worry all right okay one sec these are all important points that you have to be aware of as finance students which you won't find in any textbook okay so it is better that i give it to you okay see another thing you have to be aware of you will find a lot of people discussing you had this in the u.s market oh there's going to be a recession in 2018 just imagine in q3 2018 these economists are saying there's going to be a recession in 2020 
this is a joke okay understand that making these kind and making you can always have a tentative scenario mm -hmm. but to talk about it with any level of seriousness or emphasis is a joke mm -hmm. okay because you can't even have you seen how weather predictions are yes, even yes, weather which do you think weather forces like clouds and winds and all do you think they have to follow the laws of physics no, no? Yes, sir. wind doesn't have to follow the laws of physics <laughs> <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is even with stuff, check the hurricane predictions. I'll try to give, get that as a case study and give it to you guys. If you see when there was like a, couple, a few months ago, several months ago, there were some hurricanes in Texas, then it was followed by a big hurricane attack on Florida. Okay. So like about a day before the hurricane actually was hitting the Florida coast, I looked at six models. Okay, there are six different models of hurricane, and hurricanes are all predictable. They should be. They're not actually, because everything in the hurricane has to follow the laws of physics, and the laws of physics are well known. Okay, you had six different agencies have its six different paths for the hurricane to go through Florida. How it's going to go through Florida? Okay, and in the last six, uh, last six hours, what happened is all those six models were proved wrong. And the hurricane almost completely missed Florida, went straight into uh, you know, South Carolina. Last six hours, the hurricane changed course. That hurricane was building for at least uh, three, four weeks. They knew where it was, they tracked the progress. So if you can't even have reliable prediction, okay, six, six hours out on something like a hurricane which has some set laws, okay, winds cannot violate the laws of physics, rain cannot violate the laws, water movement cannot violate the laws of physics. Okay, and we have all the information. There are planes going into the hurricane collecting information. We have good data and still we can't predict the path of a hurricane six hours before it hits. Okay, we can't even predict accurately. So be very skeptical about any kind of long term economic focus. And economics is a totally different ballgame. Economic variables, market force, market prices, these are all driven by human expectations. Do you think human expectations have to follow certain laws? No, they don't follow any laws. Okay, that is what basically is the. Again, you will not find this in any textbook. Understand that this is a very important lesson to learn that economic variables, okay, and market prices are all driven by human expectations. Maruti is building a plant in Sanand. Why? Because they have expectations that car demand is going to rise. It may not actually rise. All those projections of units sold in their NPV analysis for the Sanand plant may turn out to be a joke. Yes, sir. They may not happen. Yes. So all is based on expect everything is based on expectations. Okay, and expectations are not rational. They are highly unstable. So please be wary of any kind of long term prediction about like sitting in Q3 2018 and saying oh 2020 there's going to be a recession in the U.S. economy. It's a waste of time. Yeah. Okay. So that's something else that you should remember. Okay, that's why I would rather ask my hot dog seller if I want to know what the economy is doing. I'd rather ask my hot dog seller than an economist. Okay, because these guys are totally clueless. They don't know what's going on in the real world. Okay, so enough lectures. Can we leave? Okay, you have a few seconds, Grace. Okay, so what? People are happy or unhappy? Happy. Okay, you're happy. Okay. All right. Okay. Happiness is... Oh, I forgot to tell you guys the joke.